say that to you? Sometimes I feel like Joel. I'm going to guess if you've heard somebody say that, that person who said it was probably going through some problems in this, in this life. <coughs> Sometimes Christians, when they face difficulties and, and adversities, they can feel kind of like Job felt. After all, he went through an awful lot of problems, so many problems that it's hard to find a problem in this life that you or I could go through that, that he doesn't have some ability to, to connect to. After all, Job lost all ten of his children on a single day. He knows the sadness of death and of problems in the home. He lost all of his vast wealth and was left penniless. He knows about financial and economic problems. Job's health was ruined by a disease that, that left him with painful boils all over his skin. In fact, the only relief he could find was by scraping those boils with a broken piece of pottery. He knows what it's like to have health, health issues. And then to top all of that off, Job's friends, when they heard that he was going through all these problems, they came to Job, but instead of offering help, they simply pointed the accusing finger at him and said, you've messed up and done some pretty awful stuff to have this happen to you. Job knows what it's like to have problems with friends. Maybe if you've had problems with friends, or health, or family, or finances, maybe you've at times not just heard people say, I feel like Job, maybe you yourselves have either said or thought, I feel like Job. But you know, if there's, if there's kind of a kinship that we feel with Job sometimes, that, that sometimes we feel kind of like him because of the problems we face, maybe, maybe it'd be worthwhile for us to stop and sit and listen to some of the things that Job actually said while he was in the middle of the problems that he faced. After all, Job was commended for his faith and his trust in the Lord. He was held up by God as an example of righteousness. And ultimately, God brought him through the problems he faced in this life. And so if you and I feel some, some connection to Job because of our problems, maybe there's something we can learn from Job as we go through those problems in our lives. And the verses that we have before us, they give us just the opportunity to do that, to sit at Job's feet and listen to him as he gives you and me an honest look at life. As Job gives us that honest look at life, he helps you and me to see ourselves correctly in this life and to also see where we can find true comfort in this life. Think about those words Job spoke, and he doesn't pull any punches, does he? He's pretty honest. Like I said, he lost everything, and that means that, that he lost his rose-tinted glasses as well. He didn't look at this life with kind of pie-in-the-sky thinking. He didn't look at this life as, as better than it is. No, he said plainly and simply, man who is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. There's a twofold verdict there, right? Life is short, and life is hot. Those two truths are ones that, that many people in this world, and maybe even you and me sometimes, try to forget about or ignore. We'd much rather think about all of the possibilities that, that are still before us. We, we'd much rather think about all the time that we still have here on this earth. But try as we might, we can't hide from ourselves the fact that this life is short and that it's hard. And Job drives that, those points home by using a couple of illustrations. He uses some pictures from everyday life to, to point out that life is hard and that life is short. And one of those illustrations is flowers. He talks about how, how flowers blossom, but then they also wither and decay. As you walked into church this morning, did you notice those, those two big mum plants that are right outside the door? Thanks to some unseasonably warm weather, they still look really good, don't they? But, but maybe as you looked at those, those mum plants, maybe you noticed that despite all the beautiful blossoms on them, there were one or two that are starting to fade. And even if we get some more unseasonably warm weather, you know what's going to happen to all of those blossoms on those plants. Eventually, all of them are going to wither and dry up 
and decay. That's what happens to flowers. It's just a fact. Because of the, the changes and stresses in, envi in, this, in their environment, no matter how vibrant, no matter how beautiful they are, they're going to decay. They're going to fade. They're going to die. And even though you are tougher than any flower, even though you are longer lived than any flower, even though you are better able to cope with the changes and the challenges and the stresses of this life than any flower could possibly hope to, you too are going to decay and wither. Yes, life sometimes blossoms. Sometimes you enjoy the, the, the joys of success and happiness. And it can be easy when, when life is blossoming like that, like, like beautiful flowers. It's easy to think, well, that's just going to go on. But the fact of the matter is, is that this life is going to also wither and decay. There's going to come those problems and those troubles, those stresses and those pains. And they're going to suck the life and the vitality out of you. And they're going to leave you feeling withered and decayed. And ultimately, they're going to end with death. As every flower that you see is a reminder that this life is hard and that it ultimately saps you of energy and strength. And Job gives us an honest look at that. He honestly holds that before your eyes and my eyes, but that's not all that he holds before our eyes. You see, if we were to continue listening to this conversation between Job and his friends, part of which is recorded in our sermon text, we would hear Job go on to talk about a restoration from that decay. We would go on to hear Job say to his friends, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Job speaks there about a restoration that was going to happen to, to his skin and his flesh after it was withered and decayed like any flower. Job talks about that, that his lifeless body was going to be restored. And Job had confidence about that restoration because of the one who was going to do the restoring. Job called him his redeemer the Lord Jesus Christ, who bought him back from sin. And that Redeemer is also your Redeemer. That Redeemer, Jesus, is someday going to restore you. He's going to restore you from all of the decay and the withering of the problems of this life, because all of those problems are tied back to sin, the very thing that Jesus has redeemed you from. And when Jesus does that, when he does restore you, it is going to be a restoration not to, to the best point you were at in this life. No, when that Savior Jesus breathes new life into your decayed bones, when he fills your withered skin with vitality on that last day, it's not going to be a partial restoration. It's going to be a complete and perfect restoration. It's going to be a renewal to what you should have been a person free from all the effects and hurts and damage of sin. That's the hope that, that you and I have. That's the hope that we as believers in Jesus have. That that Redeemer is going to give us a renewed and perfect life in heaven. But sometimes that hope seems a long way off, doesn't it? Sometimes it seems like, boy, it just, this is taking a long time for that hope to get here. But Job gives us an honest picture of how long it really is, right? Talks about life as being few of days. Talks about life as short. And he uses, once again, an illustration to drive that home. He compares our lives to that of shadows. He says that, that your life flees like a shadow and continues not. You know, Job, Job, in using that picture of a shadow, he talks about something that, that we probably don't pay a whole lot of attention to. Because of the fact that, that most of our jobs are done in places where we don't really need the light of the sun, we don't pay a whole lot of attention to the, the shadows that that sun casts. And we don't really pay a lot of attention to how quickly they change and fade into night. But you know, once you've watched a shadow, and once you've seen how quickly it just moves across the ground and how quickly it turns into night, you can't unsee that. 
I can still remember as a high school student, sitting in a classroom at some after-school activity, watching a shadow. Kind of a silly thing to do, but for some reason I was kind of bored out of my mind and was doing it anyway. And even though I knew that shadows do move because the earth rotates and revolves, I was shocked at how fast that shadow cast by the sill of a window climbed up the leg of a desk and ultimately disappeared into the darkness of night. That's what life is like, isn't it? It hurries along until finally it disappears into death. Inexorably, life proceeds to the grave. And the only way you get the faster it seems to go there, doesn't it? Even if you're still young, even if, even if life doesn't seem like it can go fast enough for you, you still know what it's like for there to be not enough time, because you've probably missed out on things because somebody told you that there just isn't time to do that. People recognize that this life is short. And so they, they try to, to fix that problem in a couple of different ways. They try to deal with that reality. Sometimes it's by trying to, to squeeze as much out of life as possible, kind of treating life like, a, like an orange people peel that you want to squeeze the last drop out of. And some people make bucket lists and try to, to get in every last enjoyable experience they can. Or another solution is to try to, try to push the goalposts a little bit, right? You think of all the millions of dollars that are spent on, on medical technology and advances in order to, to try to extend life for a while. But there really isn't a lot of genuine comfort in either of those solutions, is there? In fact, Job points out that there isn't any comfort in, in the one, to be sure. He says that, the man, that man's days are determined, and the number of his months is with God, who has appointed the limits that he cannot pass. No amount of medical technology is going to make a huge dent in the longevity of human life. And in the light of that fact, no amount of cramming as much enjoyable stuff in as you can is going to really ever be enough because there's always going to be something else that you'd want to cram in that you just couldn't. If we want real comfort in the face of the shortness of life, then we need to turn away from those, those human solutions that don't bring any real comfort. And instead, what we need to do is we need to turn to a different source of comfort. And Job points us to a different source of comfort. A little bit later in this conversation, after, after the verses of our text, Job went on to, to point to the perfect source of comfort by saying to his friends, Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven, and he who testifies for me is on high. That witness that Job talks about, that person who is going to testify, that's the eternal God, the same God who came down in flesh and blood to this earth as the Savior for sinners. And there's a reason why Job talked about him as a witness, why he spoke of the, the testimony that this God gives. Because it's only in God's testimony that people can find real comfort at the shortness of life. And that's because the testimony that the Lord God gives to sinful people, the, the testimony that he gives is that he has sent his son into this world to save them from sin and to give them eternal life. The testimony that that God gives to his children is that I give you eternal life. And that isn't just what God testified about Joel. It's what God will testify about you on that last day when he comes to judge the living and the dead. He will testify as the ultimate authority, I give you eternal life, life that cannot be taken away, life that will never end. What a testimony. What a testimony when, when the doctor comes in and says to you or to a loved one that you know was a believer, only so much longer to live. What a testimony when you, you finally celebrate that birthday that marks that you're over the hill and that now, theoretically, you're closer to your death date than your birth date. What a testimony that is when you have that, that brush with death in an accident that reminds you that no matter how young you are, you're never too young to die. What a testimony for all of those times 
when death looms large and the shortness of life is right there staring you and me in the face. What a comfort to have that testimony of God. I give you life. Eternal life. That kind of a testimony can only come from God. It has to be that way. And Job tells us why it has to be that way. He asks the question, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? There is not one. Obviously, Job isn't talking about taking something that's got some dirt on it and making it clean. If he was, the answer would be different, right? Anybody can do that. You or I can take something that's got dirt and we can wash it off. But what Job is talking about there when he talks about unclean and clean is he's talking about people being unclean with sin. There's nobody, not you, not me, not anyone, who can make someone unclean with sin into someone who is clean from sin. In fact, the Bible tells us elsewhere, the, the, the prophet Isaiah says that all of our righteous acts, all the very best things that we can do in this life, they're like filthy rags. We have no ability to cleanse ourselves from sin. And so it's no wonder that an honest look at life has to conclude that we are few of days and full of trouble. And that's why it's so wonderful and so amazing that God has said, but you were washed. You were justified. You were sanctified. By? By what? By your efforts? By your works? No. But by the Spirit of our God, by the blood of Jesus Christ, which purifies you from every sin. Since you and I couldn't do the job of cleaning away our sins, God took that job for himself. He said, let me do that. <clears throat> he needed to move heaven and earth to do it. But that's what he did. I mean, you just think about it. God arranged all of human history for Jesus to reconcile all things to himself. In fact, God even arranged all of human history so that you could be washed in the waters of baptism and call this child. And so now God can testify that you have eternal life. And there is no comfort greater than that in the face of the shortness of this life. I feel like Job. If you've ever said that, if you've ever said, I feel like Job because of the problems that you've felt in this life, you're really only half right. <laughs> yes, you, you can feel like Job to a certain extent by going through problems, but to really feel like Job requires more than just going through problems. To feel like Job also means to have the same confidence and comfort that he did. And so God grant that as you look at this life, as you honestly see that it is short and that it is hard, may God grant that you would find comfort in that Redeemer who restores you to everlasting life. Amen. <coughs> Please stand. Now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue by joining in the song, You Are God, We Praise You, found on page 28 in the New Service. <coughs>